Hello, and welcome to HIV.gov's coverage of the 2023 Conference on Retroviruses and Opportunistic Infections, or CROI. I'm Steve Holman. Joining us here in Seattle today to talk about some of the early presentations done here at the conference is Carl Diefenbach. Carl is the director of the Division of AIDS at NIH's National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Welcome, Carl. It's great to be here with you, Steve, and it's great to be at the 30th CROI. We're glad to have you. So, Carl, let's first ask our viewers if they have any questions about the topics that we're discussing to go ahead and put them in the comments and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. So the first 24 hours of the conference, Carl, has been filled with a variety of really interesting presentations and this is only the first day. Indeed. So we've had uh, two sets of plenary sessions, both of which have focused a little bit on history. Last night we heard um, about the history of activism, um, participation by community in the trials mm -hmm. and women in Africa. We heard about the history of HIV in Africa from Kevin DeCock. Yep. The first presentation was by Yvette. And Yvette was, Raphael. Uh, Yvette Raphael. It was really fantastic. And then we heard from Dr. Fauci. Uh, Dr. Fauci spoke about 30 years of CROI, but interspersed in that was a theme about the history and how things grow from discoveries that are first reported maybe even in an abstract uh, here at, at a CROI conference, mm -hmm. only to become policy years later. And that was a really interesting journey that he took us on. It really was fascinating. He, he highlighted a lot of wow moments um, in history of HIV, as you say, some of which began here in presentations. Were there any wow moments that stood out to you in particular? Um, there weren't any in particular, but I think there were several that were just so interesting related to the first reports on treatment as prevention, the first mm -hmm. studies reported on animal studies and other th that testing pre-exposure prophylaxis. Those are the kinds of things that have grown over time to become standards of our prevention agenda. Absolutely. So today at the conference, we got an update on something that was first reported uh, last summer at the international conference. That's the use of uh, doxycycline as post-exposure prophylaxis for sexually transmitted infections, or STIs. Um, last summer, we learned um, through that study, the doxypep study that took place here in Seattle and San Francisco, that it was effective for gay and bisexual men who have sex with men um, and transgender women uh, if they took a preventive dose within 72 hours after um, un uh, condomless sexual intercourse. Today, we heard a number of related updates, mm -hmm. one from that study and then from a couple different studies. Let's talk a little bit about what we learned today. Well, let's, let's start with the easy one first, which was uh, Annie Lukemeyer had a talk today about the concern about resistance, because that is a major concern when you're dealing with bacterial infections. And there was no evidence of um, emergence of the use of doxyprep helping to advance uh, drug resistance in these bacteria. The other big study was a 500 person study by the French, uh, uh, Jean-Michel Jean Molina. Jean -Michel Molina. And he evaluated uh, several different arms, including uh, doxypep, uh, as well as um, a meningococcal B vaccine. Mm -hmm. Importantly, uh, in many ways, his uh, use of the doxyprep confirmed what was seen in, in the study that was reported out at IAS 2023 in Montreal. Um, but the, the other part of that is the interesting 50% reduction in gonorrhea uh, that the meningococcal B vaccine showed. And you, as you'd expect, it only worked against the meningo meningococcal B vaccine, worked only against gonorrhea, not against the other organisms. So that gives you a sense of the specificity of the vaccine. So it sounds like um, we're learning more about a potential way to uh, reduce the incidence of sexually transmitted infections, at least among men who have sex with men and transgender women, which these studies have focused on. We heard a little bit more today about another study um, among women. What, what did we learn? Yeah, that was a, a, an interesting study also done by a group for here in Seattle that looked at um, use of doxyprep in women in Africa that are already on pre-exposure prophylaxis. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, that sort of parallels what was done by uh, Jean-Michel and others taking populations that were already using pre-exposure prophylaxis and then asking the question, could adding doxypep 
produce um, an impact on on th these sexually mm -hmm. transmitted infections. Unfortunately, it was negative. It didn't really show much. Um, and so the question now becomes, was it behavior? Was it biology? What was it? I think one of the concerns that has been brought out from the study that was reported today in women was there really wasn't a good measure of adherence. Um, there, there, everything was by self-report. So I think there's a lot to be unpacked here. But like you said, we've made progress um, in terms of the confirmation of, of doxypep um, in men who have sex with men and transgender women. And for the, the study on uh, the DPAP study that was done among uh, women using uh, HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis in Kenya, didn't show effect of we did not. Uh, for doxypep, but there was some conversation that took place then in the session afterwards about was it because of the concentration of the drug in vaginal tissue? Was it related to adherence? Was it possibly related to uh, the, the, the strains of uh, the bacteria that were circulating that might be more resistant to the antibacterial, the antibiotic? The antibiotic. So I think there's a little bit of all of those issues that need to be explored. Uh, one is, are the, the strains circulating in Africa more resistant uh, to deoxycycline? The other interesting abstract that wasn't at, has, didn't get a lot of attention today was one out of the CDC, where they did a small 20-person uh, study looking at the distribution of the drug uh, of deoxycycline in vaginal and rectal secretions mm -hmm. in men and women. And they have completely different um, drug kinetics. Mm -hmm. In men, uh, the, uh, the secretions, the rectal secretions increase and peak about 72 hours. And in women, um, in, uh, it is, peaks in the vagina much earlier and is cleared much earlier. So right. it could well be that there's a physiological um, uh, role here for just people being having biological differences. So much to do on, in this area. So yeah. much to more more research. More to come. research is needed in this area. Speaking of more research, in, in terms of the um, uh, vaccination study that uh, Dr. Molina presented, I understand that there's a NIAID one going there on. Is. We have a study of the meninge B vaccine that is headed, headed by our colleague Jeannie Marazzo from the University of Alabama. Um, that will report out, um, and we'll see if that confirms uh, this impact on, on, uh, on gonorrhea. Terrific. Well, I know we'll take a minute to just check and see if there are any questions. Um, so one of the questions, uh, that's come in for, from a, a viewer is where can people get doxyprep? So I think that's an important question. And I think anybody who is interested in doxyprep shouldn't look much beyond their, their healthcare provider. This is a conversation between you and your healthcare provider as to whether it's appropriate for you. Only your healthcare provider can uh, can tell us that. Terrific. All right, well, Carl. This has been great to catch up with you. Yeah, there's one other thing yeah. I wanted to mention um, from a talk from today. I think we really have to highlight another anniversary here. What's that? That is the 20th anniversary anniversary of PEPFAR. And John Kanengasong, the new um, uh, uh, ambassador, mm -hmm. Ambassador Kanengasong, talked about the past, the present, and the future. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that while we've had the 30 years of PrEP, of, of, of CROI, Croy, we've also had 20 years of PEPFAR. Mm -hmm. And PEPFAR has done so much to change the face of HIV across the country. So we um, respect and honor what John has to do now, and we'll see what happens over this time. We have another question. So in terms of equity, is doxypep reaching everyone? Well, I think that's not a question that we can answer yet because it is not actually part of the standard of care. So right. again, anybody with a doctor can go talk to their doctor. And so in that sense, there's equity. But if you don't have a healthcare provider, you're, uh, you're your best bet is probably the local health department. Right, so in other words, right now, these are stu investigational studies looking to see whether or not this is a, a, an effective intervention. Once studies like this get published and um, folks that are responsible for developing guidelines can consider them, 
that's when maybe guidelines would change and there's more of an issue around um, assessing equitable access and, and uptake. I think that's true. I think the other issue is like we've seen in other diseases, um, what works for men who have sex with men and transgender individuals may not work for women. Um, and we just have to take that into account if, as the guidelines committee, uh, and that'll be on CDC to um, help it, right? All right. Well, Carl, thank you very much for this update. Let's catch up again tomorrow because we've got another full day of research presentations ahead. We do. Thank you to our viewers for joining us. Do stay tuned. Follow HIV.gov on the blog for updates as well as on our social media channels. We'll be back tomorrow with more. That's it for now.